If everything you ever wanted was to become a professional footballer, then yes. Odds are, you let it slip. Now you're left drifting aimlessly through life with barely two GCSEs to rub together and a manager at McDonald's who's young enough to be your son. Your dad wants the box room back for his train set and your mum can barely disguise the permanent look of general disappointment etched on her face whenever she sees you. You had tribes. Of course you did. So did everyone. But you didn't know when to call it quits, did you? Instead, you ignored the lure of education, of a career, a proper adult life, in favour of a misplaced belief in your own abilities that was tragically combined with a crippling laziness. Now you're lucky to get a start for the dog and duck on a Sunday and that beer belly you're sporting isn't helping that dodgy ankle and that rash. You know the one, it really needs checking out. Any chance you once had at a footballing career evaporated in a cloud of beer soap, late nights, missed opportunities and regrets years ago and now you're staring down the barrel of decades of miserable, monotonous life with little more to look forward to than death's sweet embrace. <sighs> no, no, it's okay, it's okay, I'm fine, I can go on. It's pretty bleak though, isn't it? But what if you had another chance? One more chance to capture it, to seize everything you ever wanted, to live your youth again, put in those extra hours on the training pitch, to knuckle down, to make something of yourself in the only job you ever really wanted. Well, in this series of Become a Legend Story Mode, we're gonna hand a second chance, one more roll of the football career dice to a player who never quite made it. And to help our new hero reach their full potential, we do need to learn a bit more about them. And to do that, we need to go back to the beginning, way back. All the way back to 1985, a year that brought us the Truffle Shuffle, the Nez, Live Aid, and sadly, a football season blighted by two tragic events that took place mere weeks apart. The devastating Bradford City Stadium fire, which was followed closely by the High Hysel Stadium disaster. A dark time for football, particularly in Britain. But in 1985, amongst all this tragedy, four players were born that would go on to provide so much light, so much joy and happiness for football fans around the world. Well, okay, it's three players really, but we'll get to that. First up, on the 5th of February 1985, to start off what really was a vintage year for footballing births, we find ourselves in Punjau on the Portuguese island of Madeira to celebrate the birth of, for some, the greatest player of all time, Cristiano Ronaldo. Seven months later, in the city of Zadar, in what was at this point still Yugoslavia rather than Croatia, little Ronnie was joined by another future Ballon d'Or winner, Luka Modric. That's 1985 again there, continuing to deliver. And to complete the hat-trick of world-class talents, we need to take a trip to the Liverpudlian suburb of Croxteth on the 24th of October. And who is that beautiful baby boy? Well, it's none other than Big Wazza. Sadly, never a Ballon d'Or winner, but certainly good enough to have deserved one at his peak. But hang on, didn't you say four players? Ah, yes, uh, there is a fourth. Not quite at the same level, though. <laughs> Born 200 miles south of Liverpool in the English city of Guildford, just a month after Wayne Rooney was... Um, me. Yep. Bet you weren't expecting that, were you? But you know what? I've spent years on this channel turning other players into legends, but this time I thought, no, I want to crack at it myself. Now, you might be thinking this seems like nothing more than a sad, pathetic attempt to live out a failed dream of being a footballer through a YouTube channel to an audience who possibly maybe aren't even that bothered, and you would be absolutely spot on. But... I fancied giving it a go, and I don't think there's any way we're going to see me in an England shirt if we don't do this. And that's the goal. Of course it is. Playing for your country, playing for the club you love. Who knows? One day we might get there. But before we do get there, we're going to go back in time and take a look at my real-life history when it comes to football which is limited, as we'll see, but let's check it out. So, as we've seen, I was born in the wholly unremarkable city of Guildford, and for the first three years of my life, it has to be said my dedication to football was sorely lacking. Playing on swings, in red dungarees, where are the cones, the free kick dummies? You won't be smiling in 32 years when you realize your football career is long gone, you complacent fool. Okay, to be fair to him, he didn't grow up in a footballing family. In fact, the last recorded footballer of any note on any side of my family tree was my maternal grandfather, seen here looking rightly triumphant after featuring for the now legendary 1922 Wallasey Boys side in their famous Cheshire Shield final win. Was lifelong Everton fan John Trevor Hughes the source of my love of football? Sadly, I never had the chance to meet him, but through a dormant footballing gene, yes, I believe so. 
So cheers for that, John. It wasn't until the 90s that my football journey began in earnest, with the now six-year-old me turning out for my school side sporting precariously skinny legs and a mop of blonde hair that accounted for roughly half my height. In this picture you get a glimpse of my, at that point, pioneering decision to wear gloves as an outfield player. This photo amazes me. I feel like it could have been from the 1930s if colour photography was popular then. It just looks weird, doesn't it? It's not that long ago. It's quite a long time ago. Anyway, a trailblazer. And uh, here I am standing laser focused over what was presumably a perfectly curled free kick. By 12, I'd firmly established myself as just about good enough to play right back for the school first team, the natural position of the underskilled but enthusiastic. At this point, my nickname, the Home County's Cafu, was still some way off. In fact, to be honest, I'm still waiting for it to catch on now, but I'd found my position and that was where I was to focus my talents during my short career. Quick, scrappy, fearless and determined, like a young Gary Neville without the footballing ability. As the new millennium dawned, I found myself at a sporting crossroads. I was still turning out for my now secondary school first 11, but the quickness of my early teens was developing into something close to genuine pace. I had the choice at this stage to focus either on football or my newfound athletic ability. And given the choice between competing in and winning athletics meetings or continuing as a still developing but perhaps just destined to be functional right back, I chose the temporary glory of the 100 meters. Why temporary, you ask? Well, for a time, I enjoyed my fair share of success at local level. I had the spikes, I had trained my start, the world was my oyster. As my confidence grew and I started to enter county-wide events, my genetic inadequacies quickly became apparent. Skinny and short-legged, my first 20 meters were promising, electric even. But from that point on, those blessed with long legs and muscles would simply breeze on by, seeming in my peripheral vision to be taking one step for every three of mine. Preparing this timeline, I was slightly disappointed to find that no photos of me actually competing existed. This was a time before camera phones, I suppose, but considering the swiftness of my athletics downfall, it was probably of the best. Dejected, I bowed out of the sport at 16 after a very short career, having clocked a personal best of 11.6 seconds. From there, it was onto the typical activities of a 17-year-old, skateboarding, BMX riding, chasing girls and drinking cider in the park. You know, the usual. Oh, and playing Pez, of course. But sadly, perhaps, my fledgling football career was never revisited. Was the world robbed of the next Lee Dixon? An English Danny Alves, perhaps? Well, why don't we find out? We have the technology. And to do that, we're going to need to start a new timeline with a little less cider and a lot more football. So let's quickly skip back to the year 2000, strap on our imagination hat and revisit the sliding doors moment that was me picking athletics over football and reverse that decision. Now, I will make it clear at this point, as I have throughout this incredibly self-indulgent look back at a frankly mediocre sporting history, that I was never that good a footballer. But who knows? If I'd focused my attention on improving my game throughout my teens, combined with a turn of pace that would certainly aid my chasing down of tricky left-wingers... Oh, did I mention that my 100 metre personal best was only 0.2 seconds slower than Gareth Bale at pretty much the same age? No? Didn't, men didn't mention that? Well, be prepared to hear about that again. But anyway, so perhaps, just maybe, I could have broken into my local team's youth side. And that, thankfully, in this new timeline, is what happened. With GCSEs behind me, I began my career in the under-18 side of the legendary, the fabled Leatherhead FC. That's right, the Tanners, who play their football at the Cavernous Fetcham Grove. After some time in the youth teams, knuckling down and improving my game, I finally went on to make my debut for the Tanners in the Ishmian Premier Division, part of the seventh tier of English football. So now just seven leagues below the Premier League, the tip of the English football pyramid is in my sights. But to reach those levels, even with at least a decade of potential football ahead of me, it is going to be a stretch. There are, of course, notable top-level players who started in non-league, the tiers below League 2, but they are the exception rather than the rule. But with a call-up to the first team, thus began my career proper. A marginally less slight, quick and combative right-back, developing the confidence to launch surging overlapping runs and get involved in the attacks, and now beginning to see playing time against actual semi-professional footballers, real proper man-sized men. Still not exactly an aerial threat and prone to the occasional rash challenge, but improving every week. Sadly, after a few bit part appearances, late minutes in already long finished games, the bench became my new home. As my 18th birthday came and went, it felt like a landmark at which to assess my options. Disillusioned, disenchanted. Watching your school friends go to university while you work part-time, train, and then watch from the rain-soaked sidelines with the other unused subs. Is this it? 
stuck at the bottom of the pyramid forever. Idly browsing YouTube one night, we're present day now, okay? Keep up. I came across a channel made by an Australian footballer by the name of David Rowley, who had made the move from his homeland to Asia to try and make a living there as a professional footballer. A journeyman central midfielder, he enjoys small stints at clubs of various levels in places like Malaysia and Thailand, whilst candidly vlogging his experience. Hi guys, welcome back. I've got a day off, so I'm just going to answer the question that you asked me the most. How do I find a football team in Thailand? Through watching his vlogs, the world of Thai football, the agents, the ultras, the 3 plus 1 rule, is different, exciting. And the thought of travelling to and experiencing Asia whilst playing football and being paid for it becomes, during this period of self-reflection, appealing. A year on and everything has changed. Thai football agent quickly found and a switch to second tier Kassasart FC who play their football in the capital city Bangkok is secured after successful trials. From the sulky cloud filled skies of Surrey to the humid bright culture shock that is Thailand. A career kickstart leading to a hugely successful first season in Thai football. Quickly catching the eye of Thai League One giants Buriram United. And boom, here we are, present day, with the 2020 T1 League about to begin, our new side, Borough Ram United, return to action off the back of only their second season out of the last seven without a League One winner's medal. Ready and raring to return the crown to its rightful owner. Now, with a promising young English right back added to their side. We're going to learn a lot more about Thai football, Borough Ram, and much, much more as this first stage of our career goes on. But that is all to come. So, we've got the backstory, and now it's time to write the front? The front story? Yeah, let's write the front story. For those of you who've been with this channel since episode one of series one of Become a Legend Story Mode, you'll remember the tale of Jack Harrison's early career. Didn't make it at United in his youth, but bravely took a different path. American college soccer, drafting, New York. And now look, he's scoring goals against the Premier League champions under the greatest manager of all time. Can we? I mean, I replicate this even on a tiny scale at a far lower level, starting in Thailand and then who knows where. Hopefully you're all up for joining me and finding out. Oh yeah, in the next episode of the two-part prologue to this series, we're going to take a closer look at the virtual me, my physical attributes, and have a think about what stats we're going to start with. I mean, obviously, I would like to give myself 90 plus for everything, but alas, no. I've come up with a far fairer way to give an accurate representation of my skill sets as a player. And it looks a little something like this. It was all going so well. Now, if you'd like to see that episode, which I would review as entertaining, then smash that like button right this second and subscribe, obviously, if you haven't already. If we can get this video to a thousand likes in the next 24 hours, I will release the second episode of the prologue right away. Before I go, I will end this episode with a couple of potential FAQs, which I'm sure some of the long-time viewers of this channel will be interested in. Firstly, yes, there is going to be a Master League series for PES 2021, but not straight away. I think this series is going to be good though, so hopefully that will lessen the blow and I really urge you to give it a try. Secondly, for now, I won't be live streaming. I enjoyed my months of going live twice a week, but this year I want to get back to the edited videos which this channel started on and frankly, I prefer making. There may certainly be some one-off streams to come and maybe some stream-only series. I've yet to decide, uh, but I'll make sure you're all well aware of that before they start. Schedule wise, I'm going to be playing it a little bit fast and loose uh, this year as we start off this new series. Um, but once a week is certainly my goal and I'll try and nail down a particular day that they're going to come out on. And if possible, if I get into the flow with the editing, it might be more than once a week. So thanks for joining me. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this series in the comments. It's a little bit different to anything we've done before and there's certainly going to be some uh, big differences in the upcoming episodes. Um, there's certainly some interesting tweaks and surprises to come, which I'm really looking forward to sharing with you. If you haven't already subbed, then it would be great if you did. It does really help me out, and I'll see you in a bit.